Jen Delaney, welcome to the Outperform Podcast. How are you? Good. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you this morning. Well, thank you so much for being here. What does it mean to you to outperform and how do you define outperforming in your life? I think outperforming is, for me, is stretching kind of the, the norm. When I think about my performance, I'm always looking for a way to optimize. You know, do I need more sunshine? Do I, you know, do I need more water? Do I need to adjust my food? But if I'm going to, you know, the only metric I really measure against is myself. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair. I, you know, I could measure myself against an NBA player, but I'm five foot five and what do I really have in common? So for me, it's about what can I do on a small level to fix or change or tweak what I have going on so that, because the only metric I can measure against is me. Mm -hmm. A couple of things that I want to go into there, but before we even start to dig in, tell people a little bit about yourself, what it is that you do and your background. So my background is one that comes from the health space. I have been a licensed massage therapist for, I think I started my education about 12 years ago. Um, so really that was about me digging in and wanting to help people. I have a knack for finding that one little spot that hurts really bad without really getting much direction. Um, I also have a knack for getting rid of those things. But I started my health journey almost 25 years ago with a car accident. And I was very, very sick. I had a great neurologist who kind of walked me through how to journal my food, figure out what I was doing, figure out what was working and what wasn't working. And I got back to a fairly normal life. Well, then I got sick again. Um, and I took all of those principles and I started over again. And I had a doctor who said, oh, well, you have fibromyalgia and something else, but it's not food related, except I figured out it's all food related for me. I have a really bad reaction to corn, to some other things, minor reactions, but I have to tweak my system. I have to tweak my diet that fits my stuff. There's a lot of healthy, healthy foods that I can't eat. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that people get caught up in that. Oh, well, well, it's healthy. I, yeah, zucchini's great. It's not, it doesn't work for me. I get weird nerve pain and tingling and it's not any fun. And it's nothing is, nothing that creates that kind of inflammation is going to be healthy for me. That doesn't mean it's not going to work for you or 90% of the population, but everybody's body is just a little bit different. Mm hmm Two specific things that I want to dig into with what you initially said as well as what you just said. And the first one is I had to come to the tough realization that I wasn't going to play in the NBA either. So <laughs> it's, it, it is, have you always been someone that has measured you against you or were you originally more rooted in, I guess, social comparison and stacking yourself up to others uh, beforehand, and then you've kind of learned to measure you against you, or how's that evolved? I think that, that that's taken a lot of time and a lot of self-awareness. I don't think that you can grow up in the American society specifically. I don't really know how it is for others, but you can't grow up in the American society and not be bombarded by the magazines in the grocery aisle. Like little girls and teen magazines and women in Cosmo and all of those things, it's very hard not to say, oh, well, you know, she looks great in that or she tried that and it worked. It's very, very hard to not compare yourself to people who have been, they had a fitness trainer, they have, they have a pref professional chef and all of their pictures are airbrushed. It's, it's mm -hmm. very hard. And I, I think having a daughter, um, and watching her start as a very young child to see those things. And, you know, I didn't like to use the word fat in our house. You know, I don't, didn't like to use, I don't use the word diet. Mm -hmm. um, for me, my daughter knows diet means the current regime of foods you're eating. It does not mean starve yourself to lose weight. Mm -hmm. um, so I think having a daughter made a huge impact on how my self-talk affected me and not wanting to do that in front of her so that she did not continue that cycle of negative self-talk that so many people, you know, it's just like, you don't think about saying, oh, well, my butt is so big. I don't mm -hmm. have a big butt, but, or, or, oh, my nose, you know, it enters the room before I have a friend who's always on herself about her nose. I'm like, would you ever, would you ever say that to me? And she goes, well, no. Why do you, why do you say it to yourself? 
Well, cause, cause it's, it's no, you don't say those negative things to yourself. If you wouldn't say it to somebody else, you just don't say it to yourself. Yeah. I, I sometimes find that really interesting. And uh, I mean, especially because I've dealt so much in athletics. One of the things that I find fascinating now is when you have like athletes that are mic'd up during a game or a competition, you can hear exactly what they're saying throughout the entire game or competition. And I oftentimes say, if we were to just mic you up every single day, as far as what you say to yourself, what would that look like? Because we are always so much harder on ourselves and we say things to ourselves that we would never say to anyone else. There was a, there's a meme or a saying or something that I saw that basically said, if the words you said about yourself showed up on your skin, what would you say? <laughs> Like, would you say those horrible things if you knew it was just going to, if it was going to just magically type down your arm, would you say those things about yourself so everybody else could see what you had to say? Yeah. We, we as a society, I mean, we're programmed movie stars and TV stars and athletes. And we're, you know, now with these wonderful, horrible things like Instagram and Twitter, and you can put a thousand pictures up a day and we're comparing our lives and fear of missing out and all of those things. But if we don't take care of ourselves, if you don't take care of what you have, then how are you going to be good to anybody else? And like I said, having a daughter really made me focus on what things that I said mm -hmm. out loud. And if I'm not saying them out loud, I'm less likely to e even say them in my head. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very tough mindset shift and you have to constantly remind yourself to be nice to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be kind to yourself. One of the things I want to come back to that you said before was the word optimization, which is, I love that word. And to me, optimization is what we're all after personally, professionally, athletically, anything else. Did your journey to optimization start with the car accident and then getting sick? Or talk to me a little bit about how you started to really look at how can I optimize what I'm doing? So with the car accident, um, this was so many years ago. We didn't know serotonin and those, you know, your stuff was made in your gut. We didn't understand the microbiome and how important that is. Wow. Um, so in that situation, I got, you know, basically I quit producing serotonin. I, which, you know, it was, it was there was a head injury, um, you know, so traumatic brain injury. And I, my chemicals just got just completely shut down. And I was basically in migraine strength pain from about 48 hours out of this car accident. So um, when I finally got to the right doctor and she was like, okay, these are all the things that we're going to do to tweak your system. And we're going to, you know, we're going to rebuild your, your stores. We're going to rebuild your system and we'll get you back. But here's your guideline. And I used to joke, like I joke and I still call it the white diet and health gurus right now. And I'm pretty sure the neurologist who taught it to me would just be just horrified with what we know now. I literally survived for a couple of years on bagels and cream cheese, popcorn, <laughs> um, meat, as long as there was no bread. Um, the whole thing was I couldn't, you know, I had bagels cause they had no yeast. I couldn't have any other kind of bread because it had yeast in it and yeast is a trigger. Um, I had cream cheese cause it wasn't aged. So a sharp cheddar or a Parmesan could give me a headache where the cream cheese wouldn't. So, you know, I, I dialed my, my diet down to nothing and then started adding little itty bitty bits back. So I learned eventually how to listen to my body and I learned which foods worked and which foods didn't. I was given a list, but even off that list, some things worked better than others. When I got sick the second time, the doctor gave me a 10 day elimination diet. And at the end, I didn't see any difference. And he said, well, it's not your diet. It must be something else. Um, at that same time, um, I was literally that day laid off from my job. I was paying cash for my doctor's visits anyways. And he's just like, well, just go to your doctor for some Xanax so you sleep and, you know, you'll figure it out. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I got, I, so I felt like I got fired by my doctor. Even though I was paying cash, he was worried that I wasn't going to be able to pay for more, more stuff. And I looked back at the diet and I went, you know what? There's got to be something more here. Three, you know, you know, a few weeks won't do it. 
And so I went back to the same premise and it's a premise that I teach. Of, I literally write down everything. I carried a notebook, write down everything that I ate, write down anytime anything changed, better, worse, more energy, less energy, what's going on. And it took a while, but I finally started seeing some patterns. Uh, nightshades were a problem. Um, corn is a huge problem. But even once I eliminated the corn, it took six months to fully recover. I have, if I eat corn, so if I eat a corn chip right now, I'm going to feel like I got beaten by a baseball bat, like the worst flu aches head to toe, even my hair hurts. Mm -hmm. and the peripheral neuropathy will be back in 45 minutes. It mm -hmm. took me six months to recover from the peripheral neuropathy caused just by eating corn. I don't eat corn anymore and I do pretty darn good. But I also know if I don't get enough sun, I, my energy starts to fail and I start to feel kind of crappy. And so I know that there's these other parts to it that I have to be conscious and aware of. Like I said, zucchini. Everybody's like, oh, but that's a healthy food. I don't know why it doesn't work for me, but if you felt like you had tingles going up your neck into your hairline, it's creepy. I don't like it. I'm not eating it. So for people out there that, you know, I, I oftentimes think that we don't do a good job of linking what we put into our body and how it affects the way that we think and feel and perform. Like none of us really do that great a job of that. We just kind of think, well, we don't know why we're in pain or we don't know why we're struggling to focus or we don't know why we have low energy levels. So for people out there that are watching or listening, what would your advice be on just how you get started with looking at how can I optimize my, and I hate the word diet, how can I optimize my nutrition and what I'm putting into my body to be able to perform better? I think it takes some real self-discipline to think about what you're doing. I can tell you that there are probably hundreds of thousands of women who suffer from fibromyalgia, fatigue, all of these things, and they go to the salon every week or two and they get their nails done. And that starts with a half an hour dip in acetone. Mm -hmm. That 30 minutes with my fingertips in acetone is going to put me down for three days. Is going to put you down. It's going to put me down. I'm going to feel sick. I'm going to feel tired. People don't think about just not even what they're eating, but what we put on our skin. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who has a horrible reaction to WD-40 of all random things. Mm -hmm. But people forget it's not just, you know, what goes in your body doesn't just go in by mouth. It also goes in by skin. And I think you have to take a hard look at all of the things that you're doing. And like I said, for me, it's writing it down and seeing it takes a little bit of time to write those things down and see what, where the change is. Cause sometimes inflammation can take 48 hours from, I ate something 48 hours ago to now it's affecting my body and people forget that it's not always instant. Mm -hmm. Well, and that inflammation can certainly stay in your body for a lot longer than that too. So if you're, let's just say you're advising me and I'm eating five or six small meals a day of a, a lot of different things, how do I begin to link what I'm putting into my body and whether it is helping my performance or hurting my performance? Like, I guess, where, what is that starting point? So the starting point is, how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? Okay. It, starts with paper. it starts with paper and pen. And for me, it's really that simple. And it needs to be, you can't, this is not one of those things that you can just like throw a picture on Instagram and hope that it's going to, it's, you know, you can't take a picture of your food and go, Oh, look, I ate this. You right. have to start with a baseline. Yeah. This is how I feel today. So mm -hmm. if I write down, you know, if I do a scale, you know, pain scale is a wonderful thing just because it's a very simple thing. People understand it. They've seen it before. Yep. How do I feel when I wake up? Am I a six or, a nine, or am I an eight? Okay, so I ate that first breakfast and I wrote down, okay, so I had some oatmeal with some raisins and some pecans and a little bit of maple syrup. Okay, perfect, I wrote that down. Well, two hours from now, if that's what I ate for breakfast and two hours from now, I feel great, I'm gonna write, okay, I went from a six to a nine. Mm -hmm. you know. But then I go and I eat lunch and I had eggs for lunch. I, I, I don't know, whatever the next meal is. And then all of a sudden I real, you know, and I'm writing down in my journal 45 minutes later, 
I feel like garbage. What just happened? My energy just plummeted. You have to write those things down and it won't come clear for a while. You'll have to spread all that paper out and say, okay, I, I advise people take multiple colored pens and say, okay, this is where I feel better. This color feels good. This is bad. This is good. This is bad. This is good. So that you can really start to see the patterns filter in. I realized when I did it the last time, when I got really, really sick, that every time I had a cheeseburger and french fries, I felt bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it the cheeseburger? Is it the bun? Is it the cheese? Is it the potatoes? Is it the grease the potatoes was cooked in? So it became a matter of, okay, well, I'm going to go eat a cheeseburger with no bun and see if it changes. I, I, could, I was able to pick out some, some things to test. And it takes some testing. It, cause just because I tell you that, you know, like I said, zucchini doesn't work for me, doesn't mean that you shouldn't try it. Mm -hmm. It's not on anybody, that is not on anybody's list right now. Nobody, no health guru, unless they're a carnivore and they're like, absolutely don't eat vegetables. Nobody's going to say, oh yeah, zucchinis are dangerous. Yeah. They're not, but I react to them. And I think that that's something we all want a one fix thing. Yeah. We all want a, you know, here's the template, do this and you'll feel great. I took a high stress job and felt better. And it took me a minute to figure it out. I was outside about four to six hours every day that I wasn't previously. So vitamin D might be a big thing for you. I think vitamin D was vitamin D was definitely the thing for me. And, you know, and that realization, even just a couple of years ago, was just like, okay, I need to make a much more concerted effort to get out and make sure I get that sun as often as I can, as much as I can. And I don't feel like all of the vitamin D that I ingested orally, I don't feel like any of it ever had near the effect that an hour in the sun does. I would agree on that. And especially living in Minnesota, I mean, going through the winter time and we, we don't get that much sun here to begin with. So I actually think anybody can benefit from supplemental vitamin D, but there is still nothing better than actually getting out and getting in the sun, getting your vitamin D that way. So before I have you expand on some other things that people can potentially do, um, I want to make sure that I get tactical with this. So if people are because I will feel great after eating a donut, but then after maybe an hour or two, I will start to crash. So is there a specific period of time that after, if I'm going to experiment on myself, after I've eaten a meal or a snack, that I would write down my level of pain or energy in regards to doing this? I feel like for me, the magic, you know, that kind of that magic number, I'm going to know within 45 minutes. If I'm going to have a really strong reaction to something, I'm going to have it in 45 minutes. That 45 minutes is probably about the same that you would have with your sugar levels. If you eat that giant sugar donut in about 40, you're going to go up and then 45 minutes later, you're going to start coming down. So you're yeah. going to start to notice that dive in your energy levels. Um, but that's why I like kind of doing the journaling because then it's just a matter of, and it can be a little teeny tiny note. I've used little itty bitty notebooks. I've carried a binder. I've carried a scrap of paper and then transferred it later in the day. Um, I've experimented with Evernote and with Google Drive, but I like to, which you can print those out later, but I like to have that tangible go back and draw on it and color on it and see where my notes kind of you know, kind of change. It's, it's really about when you notice that change, mm -hmm. that then you go back and write it down. And I highly advocate, you know, as I'm keeping, you know, okay, if I ate lunch at 1223, I wrote down that I ate lunch at 1223. Yeah. And then if I noticed that big tweak in my system, it was like, okay, well that was, you know, that was at 245. Go back. Did I eat anything in that? Did I eat or drink anything? Did I eat a piece of gum? Did I have a mint? Like I said, those sugar-free... I joke about it. One sugar-free icebreaker mint can ruin my day. It's the same creepy chemical that's in Coke Zero, and I can't pronounce it. It starts with a pH, and there's like too many consonants in a row. And <laughs> but I know, I know, if I sat down and drank, I could, and I don't, but I could sit down and drink a diet Coke, and I would be fine. It's not going to train wreck my day. If I drink a Coke Zero right now, by noon, I'm done. I'm so it's just the one that. specific ingredient in that, icebreaker mints or Coke Zero that is triggering something within you. 
for me, it's that particular fake sweetener has a horrible, I have a horrible reaction to it. Like I said, for me, getting my fingernails done, I can't handle the acetone. So now I don't do, I don't do my nails anymore. You know, it's like, I'll just break these natural ones off doing all kinds of crazy stuff, digging in stuff and making projects. And, mm-hmm. and I'll, that's just where I'm at now. I know that it's not worth the benefits, not worth the risk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you use the word reaction before. So when we're talking about reactions to foods, if I'm going to write down, let's say 45 minutes after eating something is the most likely reaction or the thing that I would chart just my energy levels. So if it's somebody who has say fibromyalgia, I want to know if your pain went up or down. Um, cause that reaction for most people is an inflammatory reaction to what you ate. Mm-hmm. So for me, I want to know what changed and how it changed. What did you notice? You know, for me, if I, you know, like I said, if I eat corn chips in 45 minutes, I'm going to have burning and tingling around my lips. My skin on my face is going to feel sunburned and the peripheral neuropathy is going to start in my hands and my feet. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a reaction. That's a pretty, pretty clear reaction. If I eat some French fries, I might just get a little stiffness in my fingers. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get the body aches. I'm not going to get the, I'm not going to get the peripheral neuropathy. The symptoms sort of change depending on what I got myself into. One kind of side note on that is people don't necessarily think about the stuff that your doctor gave you to feel better maybe causing a reaction. They're not tracking what's happening with their meds in the reaction. My doctor gave me a pretty high dose of naproxen sodium. So um, a leave said, mm-hmm. here, try this because my, this was when I was sick and when I was just starting to do the food journaling. It took me about five days to realize and I was writing notes down like fumbly, can't quite, my dexterity is off. And I just started writing notes when I thought about it. Well, the only thing that had changed in that time frame was that I had started taking this medicine. Like literally couldn't pick up, like I tried to pick up a salt shaker and I couldn't get it from one counter to the other counter. Like couldn't, like I'm looking at it. I know I have a grip on it and just fall right on my hand. Mm-hmm. Well, if you go and read the side effects for that drug, that's a very common, it's a very common side effect. Mm-hmm. So when you're doing that kind of journaling, you really just kind of have to start being aware of your surroundings or your situation and what changed. What did you feel? It's all about you. This is not somebody else's journey. This is not somebody else's plan. Like I said, I can't hand you a plan and say, here, just follow this and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Your perfect plan is not necessarily going to work for me. So I'm going to ask you a question here and at the risk of, you know, I don't like blanket diets and kind of blanket nutrition plans. It's just, it's, we're all individuals and we all Mm -hmm. have different reactions and responses to foods and different ingredients and everything else. But if you were to come up with, or if you were to try to identify, let's say maybe a big three, as far as things that like, these would be the three starting points or the things that I would always do this or I would never have that. I mean, I think vitamin D can very easily be one of them. I don't know anyone that would say vitamin D is not a good thing and getting some sun and doing that part of it. And I don't even know if that would be on your top three. But if you were to just start somebody off with a top three, do you have any idea what that would be? So my number one suggestion for people is work on your circadian rhythms and your circadian clock. So I want you to get out at sunrise, put your feet in the dirt somewhere and watch the sun come up. Um, We have a clock in our eye that sets all of your hormonal production. So people are like, oh yeah, well, you know, I'll take some melatonin at night. Well, your body starts producing the melatonin that you need to use at night to slow down Mm -hmm. in the morning. And it's set by you getting that light in the morning that says, oh, it's morning. So we need to start our hormone production and start our day the way that our body understands. So I would say if you could do one thing, because you're also going to be outside, you're going to get, you're not going to get any UV that's going to burn your skin. You're not out, you know, I want you naked eyes, no sunglasses, no contacts. I want you to be out in that early morning light where you're going to get some of that vitamin D, but you're not going to burn. You know, it's, it's a very mild light. It has a lot of red light in it, which is very therapeutic. I mean, you see people all the time buying a 
this brand or that brand red light to sit in front of or getting in a red light bed is very popular with athletes now, ice baths, red beds, all of these things are becoming very mainstream. But I would say if you could do, you know, the very first thing, if you could just get up and see the sunrise in the morning, then you're kind of setting your, you're starting your hormonal production, you're setting your time clock, because when the sun goes down at night, that's when the melatonin kicks into your system, tries to slow you down and get you ready for bed. So mm-hmm. people, people forget that our bodies are kind of set up on a, on a clock system that we do a darn good job of fighting with all of these lights and um, shift work. And, and we're, we're just, we're, this is not how our bodies worked for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and I think that we're, I think it's part of the reason that we're seeing so much disease, dis-ease in the body is because we're not treating it correctly. So First and foremost, if you can get up and see the sun every morning, and then you do need to get that sun on your skin in order to create the vitamin D. I think, like I said, for me, it was a big turning point. I've been jokingly telling people for decades that I'm solar powered. I love the Pacific Northwest. I want to live in the Pacific Northwest. Three, four, five days of gray, and I'm like, I hate it here. Why am I here? And, you know, so I know that I do better when I get the sun. So see the sunrise, get some sun. As far as, you know, I don't like to promote any kind of specific diet. Um, I just don't. Um, Because I really do believe that everything works differently for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, But if I were to pick something that's kind of current and mainstream right now, it would probably be keto with with an emphasis emphasis on eating, you know, more seafood, um, oysters, shrimp, that sort of stuff. Um, you, the, the DHA in that for your brain is very, very important, I believe, you know, to us staying clear of mind and sharp. Mm-hmm. Um, the things that I like about keto is we don't need all the sugar. That's, that's really for me, that's one of the biggest things about keto that I like is that Americans and pe- not just Americans anymore, but we eat way, way too much sugar and sugar is in everything. It's in those bread products. It's in It's hidden in all kinds of things that people don't think about sugar being in, but I think it's important that we cut that from our systems and keto is a good way to do that. So get up first thing in the morning, get some sun, keto based diet or potentially adding in more seafood. And then is vitamin D, I mean, I guess vitamin D would probably go a little bit hand in hand, but just getting some sun first thing in the morning. Is there anything Um, else that you would say, do this or don't do that? Again, I don't mean to um, just blanket everyone into it, but. Well, yeah, because I, you know, I really do firmly believe it goes along with the getting up and seeing the sunrise in the morning and kind of setting the stage for your day. We don't need 80 inch TVs with you know, bright lights on in our house with LEDs blaring down on us till midnight. People mm-hmm. wonder why they don't sleep very well. And like, you just told your body it was solar noon. Like your yeah. body's going, it's noon. Why are you trying to go to bed? No wonder you're having a hard time relaxing. And I think that we're starting to see some really interesting things where um, athletes, college athletes, professional athletes are starting to show up and say, okay, well, I'm, yeah, I'm reducing my nighttime light. I'm not using my iPad in bed anymore. They're going, you're using some blue blocking technology to kind of dim those lights on their, on their evening times. And I think that there's something to be said for some sports performance could be increased. I, kids these days, kids these days, feel like an old lady when I say that. Kids these, kids these days with their iPhones in their hand from the minute they wake up in the morning till they, if they're going to bed with it, putting it under their pillow at night. No, no, you're not going to have optimal performance of the human body if you're, if you're doing that. And I think I know where you're going to go with this, but the specific reason that you would not want to be watching an 80 inch LED TV or looking at your iPad or phone right before you go to bed, is that strictly a melatonin thing? Or what is the reason that, because I've been guilty of this and a lot of us are guilty of it. It's one of those things that if we're looking to optimize performance, it's a big optimizer and it's something that you can't overlook. So what's the specific reason why that impairs sleep quality or quantity and what can people do about it if they are just glued to some type of screen? It's easy. Um, so my computer has, uh, has iris on it where in the evening it just di- I actually most of the day have it dimmed down fairly well, but it dims at dusk. It knows it lists, it looks at the clock on the, the, 
and where I'm at in the world and says, oh, it's getting dark outside. We're going to darken this. I wear red tinted glasses. I wear blue light blocking glasses from dusk every day. It doesn't matter if I'm going out to dinner. It doesn't matter if I'm going to listen to a band, especially if I'm doing like if I it used to be, I would go out with my girlfriends and we'd go listen to some music and we'd go dance and I would come home and I would lay in bed for like three hours, just like, I can't stop. I'm still just like vibrating from, you know, being in all that bright and that intensity. If I wear the blue blocking glasses and I'm not being inundated by all of the flashing lights and the stage lighting and the can lights, I can come home, turn out the lights and go to bed. And I just, I come right back down by blocking all of that blue light in the evening. I'm allowing my body to put that melatonin that I was creating in the morning to work because I'm telling my body it's dusk by, by reducing the light that's getting into my retina. I'm telling my body it's dusk. We're going to get ready to go to bed soon. So I'm going to, you know, we're going to start to slow down. We're going to start this process where the chemicals are going to start to hit. The melatonin's going to work. And then when I am ready to bed, to go to bed, I just lay down, I close my eyes and I actually go to sleep. And I've been an insomniac my entire life. This is a life changing sleeping the way I do now for the last year that I've had those glasses. It, it's life changing for me. Right. And I've noticed big benefits too. I mean, I oftentimes say that's one of the probably least healthy things about me is I just don't sleep that well. So I really do notice a distinct correlation between how much screen time am I getting like, I mean, either TV or, or phone or computer or whatever it might be. And do I actually have some type of filter or something on that um, and how it compares with my ability to sleep? So for you, it helps not only your ability to fall asleep, but also stay asleep and get into deep sleep. Is it both? Yeah, I, I really believe that it is because I was, I was a chronic, so there was something magical about 1.30 in the morning. If I did go to sleep, and I was going to wake up, it was 1.30 in the morning, and I was probably going to stay asleep till 5 or 6. And I get my best sleep between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m., and I have my entire life. And that's really not conducive to most worlds. That's just, it's just not. So um, by forcing myself to get up and, you know, start that process in the morning where I'm getting the sun on my face as it's coming up, um, I definitely see a difference. And like I said, for me, wearing those blue blocking glasses at night not doing the screen time. And I, I can still do the screen time. I have, let's see if I can pull this up and show you. I have a, my phone set up, which is kind of funny. You see how red that is? Yeah. I can't miss how red that is. I have my phone set up that at night, I just click a couple of buttons and then the screen is red. I'm also wearing my blue blockers. But this is eliminating a lot of that blue light, which is going to confuse your system and tell if you're looking at the 80 inch, my roommate loves hockey and 80 inches of a white hockey rink mm -hmm. for me to, I walk in the room and I'm like, Oh God, that's like, you might as well be staring at the sun mm -hmm. at eight, nine o'clock at night. That's not good for you. It's mm -hmm. confusing to your body. Mm -hmm. So this has definitely been a different type of outperform podcast. And I, I hope the listeners are finding this interesting because I certainly am. I, I love this. I love the optimization of what we're doing personally and professionally. I worry that some people might be a little bit lost on where to begin with how to do this. I, I think the experimentation and charting that part of it is is a great strategy and I hope people do it. Is there any other words of wisdom or advice that you would give to people that hopefully aren't perceiving this as just too difficult? Like I'm not going to go out and buy blue light blocking glasses and, you know, I'm not going to carry around a journal and start writing down every single thing that I do. I get that you have to pay that price of admission sometimes if you want the result, but is there are there any other strategies that you would give people as just a starting point to linking sleep or food or exercise or movement or sauna or anything else to how they're currently performing? Well, something that somebody changed, helped me change my mindset about was um, this stuff seems hard, but being sick is harder. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah you're you right are, on that. If yeah. you are already impaired, if you are already sick, 
then obviously, you know, this might seem daunting, but writing down what you're doing is a very simple step. You can carry one folded up piece of paper in your wallet and just write down, you can transfer it over later when you get home. But really for me, if you could eliminate some of the artificial light at night and get that early morning sun, you're getting a lot more than a lot of people are. I mean, we live an indoor lifestyle, but that's not how the human body is optimized to perform, period. Mm -hmm. It's just not. You know, we were hunters and gatherers. We were farmers. We did all that. And, you know, only for the last hundred years have we had these wonderful technological advancements. And also, if you look at that, you know, the technological advancements are going like this and the human health condition is going like this. Mm -hmm. So where on your axis, you know, where in the, that, 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 that axis are you and what's important to you? If you want to, if you want to make some small changes, then start with some really little ones. Go eat your lunch outside. Go eat yeah. your lunch outside. Take your lunch and go outside in the sun. If you can get barefoot, I know not everybody can do that. And, you know, if you can get some, you know, get grounded, that would be great. But if you want to make one teeny tiny little change, take your lunch outside every day. Yeah. That's actually a great strategy. And I, I heard you say the word before, disease, and I heard you say it as dis-ease, which I don't know if people caught up on that, but a lot of times we think, well, I don't have a disease. Like, I'm not right. diseased, but the root of the word disease is dis-ease yeah. within the body. And if we start to think about, I can do these simple things as far as getting more natural light, less artificial light, you know, enhancing some of my diets and, uh, you know, different things that I'm putting into my body. I think it just, it can just have a massive difference as far as the amount of dis-ease that we have within the body. Well, and I said it that way simply because not everybody has a diagnosable disease. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Some of us just have you know, I just, you know, I just don't feel like I did five years ago, or I don't feel as good as I did 10 years ago. That's not, that's not forever. You can make small changes. Like I said, I took a crazy stressful job and felt better because yeah. I, because I was outside a lot of that job. So sometimes it's just figuring out what you can do. It's, it's that outperform. It's that optimization is there one little teeny tiny tweak? And for some people, it will be as simple as they ate their lunch outside every day for a week. And wow, Saturday morning, they hopped out of bed and they felt better than they had in years. It might just be that 20, 30 minutes of sunshine. They got a little bit of real vitamin D, you know, self-made, the perfect kind for you because everybody's a little different. They might just be that person who just needs that extra 20 minutes, that extra 20 minutes, five days a week could make a huge difference in you where I need 45. Yeah, that's awesome. Jen, thank you very much. If people want to learn a little bit more about you and what it is that you do, where can they find you? So there's a, there's a lot going on. Um, so I, um, I can be found on Instagram at the Jen Delaney, two N's in Jen. As my friend used to call me, I was, I was two N Jen. Um, it, somehow it just, it sticks with people and it makes it easier. Um, I, Jen Delaney on Facebook. Um, I have a, I have a public profile there as well. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of in the, the, the growing stages right now. Um, Jen Delaney.com is a thing. It's just not, it's, I think it still says coming soon. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, I think we're always in a state of flux, like I said earlier, but yeah, so pretty much if you start Googling Jen Delaney with two N's, you'll find me eventually. My hair could be pink. Uh, you just never know. Two N Jen. Two N Jen. And we'll remember you as two N Jen. Yeah. Any other parting shots that you would like to leave with the audience? Get out. I assume you mean get, get, outside, get outside, right? Get, out. get <laughs> outside. Get outside. Maybe get out of your comfort zone, but get outside. I, we just, we're not getting enough in our current iteration of life. Any, almost any of us get outside, get some sunshine, get some fresh air. I was, I also like to tell people to get high, but that's an elevation thing. Like go, go hike, go outside, get into the mountains, get uh, out and get high. I, yeah, they, uh, so yeah, yeah, I know that can be taken so many different ways, but what I, yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my, I, I split time between Minneapolis and Denver, Colorado. So certainly high can be. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, taken not- literally or figuratively or done a lot of different ways. I'm so thinking, I'm thinking Pike's Peak High. Like, <laughs> like, go hike Pike's Peak. Yeah, get some elevation because it'll get you outside. It'll get you in the dirt. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Jen, on behalf of the entire audience, we want to thank you for sharing your wisdom with us here today. And uh, we wish you all the best going forward as you continue to optimize what you're doing. Well, if, you know, if I come up with the magic pill, I'll sure let you know. But like I said, it's the little things that, that get us all and you just got to be aware of them. Yeah. Well, I want some of that magic pill if you happen to find it. Unfortunately, I don't think one exists, but <laughs> there, is, there are small magic pills for all of us we're willing to take the time to notice. Yeah, absolutely. All right. To all of you out there listening and watching, have a great day and keep outperforming.